Let us start. So my name is Evgeny Murnaev. <coughs> and Rodrigo, I'm sorry, could you please bring me some water? Eh? I'm, I'm very sorry, but <laughs> it's just not, 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 there is no water here. Um, so let us start. So I'll describe, describe briefly with you some of our recent uh, findings on how we can apply convolutional neural networks to process uh, so-called 3D, 3D data. So I, I am a head of uh, research group here in Skoltia. We work on, we work on uh, deep learning uh, for predictive analytics, industrial applications and uh, 3D computer vision. Publish uh, papers in uh, various conferences and also collaborate with different industrial companies. It's a long history of collaboration with various th entities like Airbus, Huawei, uh, Bosch and others. Right. Huh? Oh, thank you very much. Um, and so, actually, the, the first work I'd like to present is devoted to 3D convolutional models uh, for uh, latent convolutional models for processing of image data and then actually we generalized it to process so-called 3D data. But let us first talk about user image data. So, what, uh, why do we need latent models? Why do we need generative models? We have some uh, latent space Z, uh, say a sphere in uh, some uh, Euclidean space, and we construct a mapping from the space to the space of images uh, realized by a neural network parameterized by the vector of parameters theta. Uh, this uh, uh, mapping is uh, given by uh, convolutional neural network, which is depict, depicted uh, here. It's a sequence of uh, linear and nonlinear transformations with filters. And in principle, if we tune coefficients of the transformation in an appropriate way, we can model quite complex images. And uh, nowadays, uh, generative adversarial neural networks are very well known. As a, as a tool for generative modeling. So these networks have two transformations. The first one transform latent space Z uh, to image. Uh, we denote this transformation by G sub theta. Another uh, transformation uh, works, thank you very much, uh, works as a discriminator. So it transforms, uh, uh, it, it, it classifies whether the image is artificial or real, and it transforms uh, uh, any of images to the, the corresponding label. And though these two models compete with each other in order to uh, get the highest possible accuracy. Uh, and uh, uh, in case of generative models, we just have one mapping which maps latent, uh, uh, latent vector to, to an image. Uh, and uh, if uh, we sample in the latent space, then we can uh, generate uh, images which I denote here by x1, x2, etc., x, x sub n. And uh, actually, uh, nowadays, um, these generative models allow to model images quite accurately, like, uh, for example, here, it's a well-known model called progressive GANs. Uh, however, uh, the, all these models uh, have a lot of drawbacks, actually. Uh, I will uh, comment on this a little bit later, but first let, us exp let, let me explain why do I need a generative model, how I can use it. Uh, actually, I can use a generative model in order to perform image uh, restoration. So let us assume that we have some generative model the, uh, G sub theta, and I have an image which I denote here by Y. So uh, this image uh, uh, is given in some low resolution. And uh, or, for example, this image uh, has some missing pixels, and I would like to recover uh, the, either the resolution of the image or I would like to recover uh, the, those missing pixels. And so, uh, 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 in order to do this, I can construct a probabilistic model as follows. I impose some prior 
on latent uh, space. This prior is denoted by P of Z. And also I have a likelihood which is denoted here by P of Y given uh, G of Z. This is the distribution of image uh, pixels given some particular latent uh, vector and uh, G of Z is a mapping from latent space to an image space. And then I uh, can uh, find the uh, arg uh, optimum, arg maximum of this log likelihood. That is, I find uh, the most probable latent vector corresponding to a particular image. And then I uh, can, uh, but, but actually this likelihood, it can be evaluated using only uh, those, only, only known pixels of, uh, of the image. Uh, so, uh, by why here, in the log likelihood, I put only uh, those pixels for which I know values. And then I find uh, the corresponding latent vector, and then I uh, uh, take this uh, latent vector and calculate uh, uh, prediction of unknown pixels of the image. In this way, I can recover missing pixels of the image, or I can, for example, recover additional pixels in order to increase the in order to increase the resolution of the image and so uh, this is uh, obvious way how we can use uh, uh, generative model for image restoration and actually uh, uh, these uh, we, wish, we, we would like to construct such generative model that can work for any uh, of image restoration tasks However, if we uh, use uh, existing generative models like GANs, for example, then uh, their quality could be quite, quite bad. So uh, here I, optimi I optimize uh, uh, the distance between, the, uh, between known pixels uh, and the positions of these known pixels is depicted by the mask M. And uh, uh, I try to find such latent vector Z which provides the smallest uh, distance between uh, pixels predicted by the neural network and uh, known pixels. And then I take this Z this to recover missing pixels. And so uh, you can see that uh, existing uh, models uh, based on generative adversarial networks, these models are not good. So I just uh, use... Uh, some uh, GAN model as, uh, as a generative model for image restoration and the results are, uh, you know, not accurate. The same is if I use uh, the recent progressive GAN model. Also results are not, not as accurate as we would like them to be. And one of possible, possible reasons is that latent space is uh, quite, uh, could be quite uh, uh, low dimensional. And so, uh, uh, actually what we want with generative models. With generative models, we, we would like uh, that uh, the domain of definition of the distribution of real images uh, is covered by the domain of uh, definition of the distribution modeled by the generative model. But uh, because of, oh, I'm sorry. But because uh, 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 in this case, in this case, I get so bad results, like you see on on these pictures, that means that actually the domain of definition of the generative model doesn't coincide accurately with the domain of definition of uh, 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 of real images of distribution of every, of real images. So it's like uh, like is depicted here by uh, blue. I depict the main definition of real images, and uh, using GAN, we can cover only small, small, a small part of it. And so uh, this is most part of distribution. Uh, these are uh, ever some samples generated by GANs, and uh, we have a lot of bad samples as well. Actually, uh, uh, GAN is no, isn't the only generative model existing on the market. There are some other generative models, like uh, Glow model, for example. Glow model is, uh, does, uh, is, uh, is a specific model which uh, uh, doesn't use any discriminator, like in case of GANs. So Glow model uh, ta just take, uh, takes uh, latent vectors and uh, uh, predict image. 
And in order to train the GLOW, we solve uh, the optimization problem uh, depicted uh, at the bottom of the slide. So we simultaneously optimize the distance between the predicted image and uh, uh, with respect to parameters of the neural network, plus we optimize simultaneously for the corresponding latent vector. And so for each image, we estimate uh, uh, its latent vector by projecting that image on the manifold defined uh, by the generative model. And so we optimize uh, with respect to all parameters, both parameters of the neural network realizing uh, the generative model and with respect to latent vectors uh, corresponding to images from the training sample. Uh, and this is GLOW model. Uh, and if we generate uh, data using this GLOW model, then samples are not as sharp, as sexy as we can, get, uh, as we can generate uh, these samples with GANs. But at the same time, still, uh, if we use these models for image restoration, we get uh, result, meaningful results, which are, in some sense, better than what we can get from uh, generative models. And so uh, the question is how we can merge the, uh, uh, how we can improve uh, this GLOW model in order to get sharper, significantly sharper results and uh, results with high resolution as in case of GANs, but at the same time uh, uh, to, uh, to be able to, to have uh, all those nice latent vectors because if you have latent vectors we can generate uh, new images and uh, uh, perform other image restoration tasks. Uh, this is the research question we would like to solve. And now let us uh, discuss some other interesting model. It was uh, developed by Ulyanov and Lipitsky uh, some time ago. It's uh, called Deep Image Prior. I guess some, uh, some of you already heard about it. So the model is quite, uh, quite unusual and interesting. We just uh, have a neural network and we don't train that neural network on uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of images. We just feed that neural network to the image uh, we fix the input to the neural network that is latent vector. This latent vector is always fixed. We randomly generate it. And we just uh, minimize the distance between uh, the prediction of the convolutional neural network and the existing image with respect to parameters of uh, the neural network. So actually in this case our latent parameters are not uh, uh, used as input to the neural network. In this case, we use as input as latent parameters just filters of the convolutional neural network. And thanks uh, to the special structure of convolutions, thanks to the special structure of those filters, actually that convolutional neural network uh, is a uh, quite good uh, already is uh, is a strong prior on on the image. In this uh, picture, I depicted how we can recover. Uh, uh, an image uh, from uh, the corrupted one. Uh, so on the left there is a corrupted image. Uh, a lot of pixels are missing. So we uh, minimize the distance between known pixels and those pixels predicted by the convolutional neural network. We minimize the distance with respect to filters of the neural network. Uh, and uh, yeah, that means that we only have one image in the training sample. And then we uh, predict uh, all missing pixels uh, as the output of the neural network. And you see that the reconstruction is very good. Uh, and uh, uh, let me just, uh, actually the structure of the deep image prior is quite simple. I mean architecture. It's like, uh, uh, it's very similar to UNET with skip connections. So there is a sequence of filters. Uh, of uh, decreasing demand, uh, size and then uh, the, the second half of their net network it's, uh, consi it consists of uh, filters with increasing size. And actually here is how uh, we can uh, reconstruct the image using that uh, approach. We take the image with a lot of missing pixels, we start to minimize uh, uh, start to feed the neural network to known pixels uh, by minimizing the distance with respect to filters of the neural network. 
And uh, on the next slides, you will see how gradually we will start predicting uh, all pixels in the image. So on the first iterations of the gradient descent, the result is very bad. Then uh, step by step, we start to improve quality. And at the end, you see these uh, accurate predictions. Uh, so, uh, uh, that means that uh, the uh, deep image prior is a, qui quite good, is a strong prior for images. However, if we try to uh, uh, solve other image reconstruction tasks using such prior, we will not get good results because, for example, you will not be able to model faces using deep image prior because, you know, uh, faces, uh, uh, they are very different from uh, pictures like this, uh, because uh, the, this picture it has a lot of a lot of uh, uh, repeating structures, and uh, uh, you don't need uh, additional uh, information from other uh, other pictures. You, in some sense, just can copy paste uh, some parts of the picture to uh, uh, reconstruct other parts of the picture, because the different parts of the picture are very similar. In case of uh, fa images with faces, you can't uh, expect uh, that this uh, will work. And so, uh, the, uh, uh, the question we tried to solve was how we can uh, combine ideas of uh, 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 classical GLOW models, uh, classical generative models with this novel idea of deep image prior. And uh, uh, so, just a brief conclusion. First of all, traditional latent models like GAN and GLOW, they are learned from data. They can provide quite impressive samples. And, uh, but but, but uh, uh, it looks, it seems like uh, they don't have a, a, a sufficient number of latent parameters to capture complex uh, behavior of natural images. Deep image prior, uh, uh, on the opposite, in the, uh, Deep, at the same time, deep image prior uh, have, uh, has a lot of uh, latent parameters because these latent parameters are filters of the neural network and uh, in a near, near real convolutional neural network you may have like tens of and hundreds of thousands of uh, parameters. At the same time, uh, at the same time, uh, with deep image prior, uh, you can't uh, construct uh, good image restoration. Uh, you can't perform good image restoration because deep image prior uh, isn't. Uh, you don't train it on uh, uh, samples of images of natural images. It can't adapt to a specific image class. Uh, and uh, so the, the the question is how to combine these two things. Uh, and let me. And, and as, a, as an answer to this question, we developed an approach uh, which is a kind of a combination of GLOW model and deep image prior. So the idea of the model is quite simple. Uh, we have a big neural network. The first part of that neural network is uh, corresponds to uh, uh, deep image prior. So it takes as input uh, some fixed uh, latent uh, vector z. Then there are a lot of convolutional layers. And parameters of these convolutional layers, they act as a, uh, uh, latent variables. And uh, because the, these parameters are convolutional filters, the dimension of those filters is very huge. But thanks to the special structure, uh, we, uh, we impose a very strong prior on uh, these convolutional filters. Uh, and then uh, output of that uh, convolutional neural network is used as input to another uh, UNET-like unit -like, uh, network, which acts as a, uh, uh, as a generator. So actually uh, we, we consider uh, some uh, architecture similar to what is usually used in case of GLOW models. And so, as training data, we have a sample of N images, X1, X2, etc., Xn. Uh, then, uh, we, uh, during the training, we should fit uh, 
parameters theta of the generator g sub theta and also we should fit uh, for each image its own latent representation and this latent representation is given by filter uh, filter convolutional filters of the first part of the whole architecture which is depicted here by red and so uh, but these uh, filters but these latent uh, parameters they have very a very specific structure they, they are convolutional uh, filt filters of the convolutional neural network. And so uh, we minimize uh, this functional. So here uh, we learn parameters theta. Also we learn uh, param convolutional parameters of the neural network which is used, uh, output of which is used uh, as input to the generator. And the parameter z, z here is always fixed. And so we, we minimize this uh, distance with respect to convolutional parameters of the uh, uh, latent space and with respect to parameters of the generator. Uh, as I said, z is fixed and x sub i is a fixed, uh, is a given data. And so, uh, uh, in, in this case, we consider a convolutional neural network, F, which, contain, which contains uh, filters with, with 24,000 free parameters. So it's quite, and because, because these parameters of the convolutional filter acts as a, uh, latent uh, variables, then uh, actual dimension of the latent space is very huge. Although, due to very specific structure of uh, this latent space, uh, actually we, uh, it has a very significant, uh, uh, you know, we, we impose a very significant regularization on the latent space. And the parameter uh, generator G, it has uh, 38 million parameters. Uh, and so that means that the actual uh, convolutional manifold, which uh, is... Uh, uh, represented uh, by output of the of that red uh, convolutional neural network uh, uh, it it is uh, it parameterized by a huge number of parameters with uh, on which we impose specific uh, regularization because they are convolutional filters uh, and uh, so, uh, because of that, actual uh, uh, domain of definition of the, our generative model is really huge and uh, we hope that it should cover domain of definition of real images. And actually, our experiments shows, show that this is the case. Let me show you results of experiments. So, this is input image and uh, there is a hole in that input image in the, in the middle. And so, we would like to recover that hole. We uh, consider a sample of similar images and train our model on it. And uh, this is the result when we apply deep image prior to, the, uh, to, to reconstruct that image. And you see here that the results are not good. Uh, this is the result when we apply some baseline generative model. Actually, it's uh, some variant of GLOW model. And uh, you see that the results are not also good. This is how what results we obtain when we apply progressive GAN. And this is the result we obtain when we apply our model. And so you see that the results are quite good. Uh, uh, and uh, this is uh, the metric we, uh, we, we optimize. So uh, we take our model, we fix uh, the input vector z, we uh, optimize uh, the f function uh, f uh, which is given by convolutional neural network with respect to convolutional parameters. Uh, in this way, we obtain uh, such latent representation for our image x, uh, which provides uh, the smallest distance between uh, the output of the generator and uh, uh, known pixels of the image. And then we, rec we can recover other uh, pixels of, of the image by uh, the output of the generator. Uh, here is another result. So here you see how we, we can improve resolution of the image. 
So uh, the first uh, uh, image, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the first uh, result of increased resolution is produced by, by, by linear uh, filter. Then uh, we also apply some baseline and also we apply uh, our generative model and the results are better. Actually, we made some uh, user study and uh, people select our results uh, corresponding to our model significantly more often than results uh, corresponding to other models. Uh, this is, uh, uh, oops, sorry. So these are results of extreme uh, image in painting. So uh, uh, we have three column, uh, three blocks of columns. Uh, each block corresponds to a particular per uh, person. So uh, to a particular method, sorry. Uh, uh, and so, uh, for example, the first column, uh, uh, here, we, here we have three faces with missing, uh, missing pixels. Uh, and uh, on, uh, the, on the, the first column, uh, uh, these are results uh, provided by baseline model. The second column, results for the same faces, but provided by our model. And so, for example, uh, uh, you can see that, uh, let me show you with a mouse. For example, uh, here, results provided by uh, results provided by uh, the comp uh, com com competitive model, I mean, uh, they are quite bad. And the results in the column number four, these results provided by uh, our model, these are results significantly better. So th there, are, there are significantly less distortions, uh, both according to some formal numerical math metrics and uh, uh, and with respect to user study results, results of user study. Uh, the same case, it's extreme image in painting, so we use baseline. So uh, for each uh, group of uh, images, the left image is uh, obtained uh, using baseline model and the right image is obtained using our model. And so we see that, uh, of, co of course, it's impossible to impaint uh, the second half of the image. It's just impossible. But in principle, at least we should interpolate uh, the second half of the image with something meaningful. And so here you can see that uh, uh, for uh, images on the right, we uh, uh, can interpolate something meaningful which reasonably interpolates missing pixels. But uh, in case of left images, uh, images on the left, the results are quite bad. Uh, these are results for super resolution. So, of course, again, it's not impossible to uh, get uh, to improve significantly improve resolution of images because here you just don't have enough information uh, to get real uh, details. But still, we would like to interpolate uh, uh, on these uh, low resolution images to put there something meaningful, which can uh, help to. Uh, well, something meaningful which can uh, reasonably, uh, visually plausible interpolate uh, these low resolution images. And uh, we obtain uh, quite, quite good results here. Although these, are, these people uh, doesn't uh, exist in, uh, actually doesn't exist and uh, these results are not uh, uh, real. Uh, so it's only in, uh, you know, in spy movies they can just uh, uh, zoom in uh, the car plate and finally get some numbers on it. Actually, uh, it doesn't work, but still this shows that our generative model is quite uh, strong in uh, imposing uh, good image prior. Uh, the same we can do with image colorization. So these are results of image colorization based on our generative model. And uh, these are results uh, based on uh, the best baseline model. And so we see here that uh, our model provides uh, more reasonable uh, colors, distribution of colors than uh, more competing models. Uh, actually, uh, this type of uh, things can be applied not only for two-dimensional images, but of course we can uh, generalize all these results to three-dimensional case.
Actually, actually, uh, nowadays there are a lot of data which comes from three-dimensional sensors. For example, uh, data from lighters, data from structured light cameras, uh, data, uh, say, from MRI or fMRI, which is very important for medical applications. And uh, all this data is not a typical image data because it has uh, specific uh, uh, representation in the form of point clouds, in the form of images with depth, or it, it can be some, uh, and uh, for example, lighter data uh, also is also represented in the form of point clouds, but with a very specific structure. It's, uh, uh, it's a date, it's a date uh, with very sparse distribution of points, a lot of uh, occlusions, a lot of missing values, and uh, uh, typical convolutional neural networks are ju just not well suited to process this data. Moreover, uh, you can't use uh, standard uh, uh, accuracy metrics uh, to estimate uh, results of uh, uh, processing of this data because uh, what is good for images may not good for point clouds and vice versa. And so, uh, because of that, uh, currently there is a big interest in uh, processing of three-dimensional data, uh, like especially of data with depth. Because uh, modern uh, mobile phones, uh, they all of them have, uh, uh, I mean, modern mobile phones uh, have uh, depth sensor in, in them, so you can me measure depth. Uh, the main problem is that usually depth resolution is very bad. So uh, with RGB camera in uh, modern mobile phones, you can obtain uh, good resolution, but... Uh, with depth, with the, the, the existing depth sensors provide only low resolution uh, depth uh, images. And so the problem is uh, that we need to increase, uh, increase uh, depth resolution. And uh, 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 here are the results, uh, our recent results on depth super resolution. Actually, the problem statement can be formulated as follows. So uh, in, this, in this project, we considered uh, depth... Uh, uh, monocular depth resolu super resolution. As input, we take uh, some image, and uh, also uh, with that image we have a depth map. So this here depth map is uh, represented also as an image, but actually uh, each pixel of that image is a distance between uh, the camera and uh, the corresponding point on on the object. And uh, what we want, we want to construct, with taking as input these uh, uh, two uh, data sources, like RGB camera image and depth sensor image, we would like to produce uh, fastly uh, uh, depth uh, image with uh, increased resolution. And uh, what is important is that we can't estimate the quality of that depth resolution because uh, a super resolution uh, using a typical image uh, metrics, like uh, we can't use here L2 error, we can't use here L1 error because uh, all these errors, uh, typical errors, are not, uh, d d do not uh, correlate uh, with uh, human perception uh, uh, how uh, a person really, uh, well, what a person really considered to be uh, visually plausible result or not plausible result. And so, uh, in order to compare, uh, to, to estimate whether depth to resolution is good or not, we need to first to recover some surface, 3D surface from the corresponding depth map. And when we recover that three-dimensional surface from the corresponding depth map, only then we can estimate the quality of uh, depth super resolution. And uh, that means that we need to, to, uh, to uh, estimate depth, uh, three-dimensional surface from low resolution depth and three-dimensional surface from high resolution depth. And then uh, compare uh, the uh, results with ground truth. And here, oops, I'm sorry, what is it? Yeah, and here you see some of our results. Actually, these results are based on uh, some variant of uh, uh, that uh, 
generative model. So in the first part of my uh, presentation, I uh, discussed with you a generative model. And uh, then we adapted that generative model to, uh, to a we added additional channels inside that generative model to process not only image data, but also to process uh, depth map. And so uh, the left uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, surface is obtained from the ground truth depth map in a high resolution. The middle uh, three-dimensional surface, and you see here a lot of distortions, so that uh, three-dimensional surface is obtained from uh, uh, Result or uh, results of depth super resolution obtained uh, using some state of the art uh, depth super resolution method. And on the right, we uh, these are results uh, uh, we, which we obtain using the proposed generative model. And so you see that uh, uh, there are no almost no uh, distortions and uh, artifacts. Uh, which, uh, which shows that uh, the proposed generative model is sufficiently uh, strong and uh, of course uh, what is also important, another component which uh, was very important to obtain such nice results, it is a special uh, perceptual metric which takes into account how we perceive uh, three-dimensional surfaces uh, recovered from depth map. Uh, so uh, what I want to say. Uh, in this uh, uh, set of work, uh, papers, we developed uh, some uh, uh, generative models and now we, uh, we are working on how uh, these generative models and other uh, neural, network, uh, uh, neural network architectures can be generalized to process various uh, types of uh, three-dimensional data, that is point clouds, uh, three-dimensional data represented as uh, voxels and others, other types. Actually, this is not the only, uh, this is not the only uh, example of three-dimensional data which we, uh, which we need to process. For example, recently we, pu we published a uh, work at CVPR uh, about uh, geometric deep uh, a, a data set for geometric deep learning. So it's a big uh, data set of CAD models with uh, meshes, uh, with nice meshes and uh, also it contains a lot of uh, characteristics of those CAD models. Uh, so it's called ABC data set. We even, we even got a, an award for uh, that data set. Uh, it contains more than one million uh, objects in CAT format and so nowadays uh, there exist a special neural networks which can uh, process data represented in the form of mesh, data represented in the form of uh, uh, graphs and uh, it's very important to have benchmarks uh, for such uh, techniques and uh, for that we need uh, big data sets with uh, baselines calculated on those data sets and so this is uh, uh, the st one of st state of the art data sets that can be used for this type of tasks. Uh, we uh, can so the, here you in the, in the table uh, on the left you can see some comparison of these uh, thing of this data set with other existing data sets. Uh, so it's very big, scalable, it contains a lot of uh, uh, features uh, for three-dimensional objects and because of that it can be used to train neural networks to process geometrical data. Uh, also we work with uh, other types of, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, of three-dimensional data and tasks. For example, here you see some of our other recent work we take as input uh, to just two-dimensional monocular image we developed a special neural network which predict, predicts position or 3D position of a car in a 3D environment uh, by taking as input only one two-dimensional image. Of course, this problem is very ill-posed, but at the same time, uh, because we train the neural network on a big sample of uh, three-dimensional data with known positions of cars, 
Still, in case uh, on the image, all cars, all uh, position of all, of all cars can be, if uh, positions of, of all cars on the image uh, is uh, visible and uh, there are no occlusions, then uh, this neural network trained on a big data set of three-dimensional data can resolve uh, three-dimensional positions of cars using as input only two-dimensional data. And so here you, on this slide, you see some, uh, some nice results. So we take as input uh, two-dimensional image above and return as output 3D positions of uh, cars, uh, predict as output uh, 3D positions of cars uh, in, in 3D environment. Uh, this is another example of how it works. So of course, these cases are quite simple because here uh, there are almost no occlusions. And if, of course, if there are occlusions, then uh, we don't get uh, such good results. So here you see that, uh, for example, in the picture on the left, uh, we have a lot of occlusions and even a person can't uh, accurately resolve uh, positions uh, of uh, and number of all cars. But and because of that, uh, here we have... Uh, we, here we, our neural network miss, uh, misses a lot of uh, cars and uh, doesn't provide accurate predictions. Okay, so uh, this I'll skip. And so what I want to say is that uh, in our uh, research group we actually uh, uh, do a lot of stuff related to uh, deep learning for three-dimensional data, but also we uh, do a lot of stuff related to uh, machine learning and deep learning for predictive analytics. In particular, we work with topological data analysis, uh, manifold learning techniques, time series analysis, and uh, we try to collaborate a lot with industrial applications because, well, this is important uh, because of data sets nowadays. <clears throat> 